Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, uh, and also, I would like to thank the organizers for the kind introduction and, and also for the invitation to give a seminar here. So it is a pleasure for me. Um, so it is uh, in this seminar, I will be discussing the image of M87 star, black hole, by the Event Horizon Telescope, and also the prospects of constraining the amount of scalar field around it. So I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Aveiro, working on black hole physics, and also mainly on testing GR using black hole imaging. So our test, uh, sorry, our journey to the image of the black hole started more than 100 years ago on May 29th of 1919. So at the time, there are two expeditions, one in Sobral in Brazil and another in Prince Island that recorded the displacement of star images during a solar eclipse. And with this displacement, it was possible to measure experimentally how gravity bends light and make the first major experimental test of general relativity, or GR for, for short. So this is a very ironic, it is quite ironic that almost 100 years later, exactly, the first image ever of a black hole was revealed to the world. So in a similar spirit uh, to the Prinsp and Subral measurements, this image here on the left shows how light rays become highly curved due to a strong gravitational field. So this famous image on the left is a snapshot of the very compact object M87 star that has a mass of around 6 billion solar masses and it lies at almost 17 megaparsecs away from us. So with this mass scale, M87 star is a very strong candidate for a supermassive black hole. And to achieve the necessary angular resolution for this image, it was necessary to use an array of telescopes scattered across several continents, forming the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT for short. And it was, they were able to do this by using very long baseline interferometry, or VLBI, which is the combined array uh, of telescopes which form an effective telescope with the size of our planet. And remarkably, the final image was consistent with the GR prediction for a curved black hole with an accretion disk flow. So the, uh, just a few comments about the M87 star. So this targeted object is a supermassive black hole candidate that resides in the faraway galaxy Messier 87. This supermassive black hole is one of the largest known at the moment. And in fact, M87 star is so large that our entire, entire solar system could fit inside it, as illustrated by this left image. So this black hole also emits a very powerful jet at, um, at relativistic speeds, stretching more than 5,000 light years. In order to understand the uh, image of M87 star <clears throat> in detail, first we have to discuss what is the expectation for a black hole image. So we can consider a very generic academic setup. A spherically symmetric compact star with mass M and radius R that has some surface texture, which is only relevant for imaging, not for the uh, assumption of spherical symmetry. And we can take the exterior of the star as vacuum, and then the exterior of the star is just described by the Schwarzschild solution. Then we can obtain the synthetic star image on the left um, via numerical ray tracing of, of light rays. When the radius r of the star is larger than 3m, the star image can be a good measure of the surface texture information. And even if the star surface is completely radiation absorbent and has no emission, like for example on the right image, the star outline still reveals the texture of the surface. However, uh, we can notice that when the radius is smaller than 3m, the star's edge becomes circular and no longer displays any surface information. 
So in this case, the image of a star that is completely radiation absorbent becomes indi indistinguishable from a black hole. So this dark image of the star would be the same as the shadow of the black hole. And the reason for this uh, is, uh, is now because the edge is actually an image of the light ring orbit at r equals 3m, and it is not actually an image of the star's surface. But to better understand even further the image of a black hole, we can consider another, another very academic setup, where we are observing a black hole in front of a background of starlight. So the light rays are attracted to the black hole's gravity, and the observed image that you can see on the left appears distorted due to gravitational lensing. And uh, here is the same image uh, of the lens star fields, where you can see some more details. And you might remember that the black hole does not emit light, at least classically, and so the image is literally the absence of light. Um, it is therefore quite appropriate that this dark region in the image is called the shadow of the black hole. Um, we can also notice that the black hole creates multiple images of the same star. For example, the star image A2 you can see here, is just a copy of the main star image A. And actually, the entire sky appears inverted and copied within the Einstein ring, which is, which is displayed here as the dashed circle in the left image. And the copied image is due to the strong bending of light by, by the black hole. This deflection increases even more as we approach the shadow edge. Light rays make more and more turns and give rise to even more image copies of the sky. And in fact, as we approach the shadow edge, light rays approach a limit bound orbit. And this process can be understood by a scattering light ray close to a black hole. For instance, a light ray can escape to infinity, it can fall into the black hole, or it can approach a, a certain bound state orbit. And in spherical symmetry, the bound orbit is the light ring, which is a planar photon orbit that encircles the black hole forever. And due to spherical symmetry, these circular orbits form what is known as the photon sphere. And uh, for, for, as, for example, you can take the scattering of light rays around the Schwarzschild black hole. The light ray needs a certain impact parameter large enough to escape the black hole. And the shadow size will correspond to the bundle of rays that barely fall into the black hole. And indeed, uh, the Schwarzschild shadow radius is almost 2.6 times larger than that of the Schwarzschild radius. And due to spherical symmetry, the Schwarzschild shadow is simply a perfect, perfect circle. Moving now to the Kerr case, to the Kerr shadow, each point of the Kerr shadow edge is determined by a spherical photon orbit. So in contrast to light rings, the general family of these spherical null orbits is not planar. So each spherical orbit is uniquely identified by two impact parameters, eta and q, which are related to constants of geodesic motion. For example, the pink point on the shadow edge here on the left, uh, is determined by the black circular orbit in the right. Um, and if we start moving along the shadow edge, the pink points now are now determined by the red non-planar non orbit on the right that has a larger radius. And you can notice how this red orbit is open at the poles. As we move further along, there is a spherical orbit at some point with zero angular momentum that closes at the poles. And moving even further along, there is a spherical orbit at some point with zero angular momentum that closes at the poles. Uh, so, sorry, mo moving further along the shadow, the radius of the spherical photon orbits continues to increase, but the amplitude of the orbit outside the equatorial plane has now become smaller. Sorry, sorry, I, I, uh, I, got, I made a mistake there. Um, 
And when we reach the last point of the shadow, it is again determined by a circular photon orbit, although now with the opposite rotation to the initial orbit. And in contrast with Schwarzschild, the Kerr shadow is determined by a photon region spanning several radii instead of a single photon sphere at a fixed radius. So this is the, one of the key points here. Um, the Kerr shadow edge can be determined uh, analytically. Let's hope this movie works. Yes. Um, the Kerr shadow edge can be determined analytically um, due to geodesic motion being completely uh, geodesic, uh, geodesically integrable. And as the spin increases, the shadow goes from being a perfect circle for the Schwarzschild case to a shape similar to the letter D for extremal curve. Okay, let me just switch off the video, continue. And in the extremal curve limit, the shadow edge is represented by a very compact, a nice analytical expression that you can see here in units of the ADM mass. I just found it uh, interesting to show this. However, in a more realistic scenario, the contrasting light that is necessary to see the shadow does not come from far away stars. Black holes can be typically expected to have an accretion disk of orbiting bright glowing matter. What would then be the black hole image with a geometrically thin accretion disk? On the left, you can see the realistically generated black hole image in the Hollywood film Interstellar that was generated with a, a simple disk. Now, notice that the strong gravitational lensing of the black hole makes the disk appear both above, uh, appear both above and below the shadow uh, here in the image. However, a thin disk is still a very simple approximation. In a more astrophysical setup, the light, the light necessary to provide contrast comes mainly from synchrotron radiation of a dynamical accretion flow around the black hole. And so thin, synthetic black hole images can be produced by simulating general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic or EMHD uh, accretion flows around the curved black hole. Although the synthetic images are now trickier to interpret, here, this image here, uh, the shadow edge is still a clear feature in the image. However, if you want to compare the simulated black hole image with the actual EHD observation, we still have to replicate the observation conditions. Since the EHD observation has limited resolution, a way to mimic the final image, uh, the quality of the final image of the EHD, to simply apply a Gaussian blurring filter. And as you can see, uh, after, we, after you apply the blurring filter to the synthetic image, uh, the result here is remarkably similar to the actual EHD data. So the uh, bottom line here is that the observed image is, at least so far, consistent with the prediction for a curved shadow. That is the main point. Uh, just a, a moment. Okay, so at first sight, uh, this image uh, shown here does not appear to have any resemblance to, with the interstellar movie picture. So if you want to see the connection uh, between this final EHD image and the image of the lens disc of the interstellar film, I'm going to show a clip courtesy of Double Negative, which is the special effects company behind the interstellar movie. So you can find you can find the uh, the video on on this link on these links over here. So uh, I hope you can see this. Uh, can you anyone please confirm if you can see this video? Yes, we can see this. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. Great. So uh, starting with the observer on the equatorial plane here, as shown, you can see the disk appearing both above and below due to lensing which is very interstellar-like. But as the observer moves closer to the rotation axis, uh, so the poles, the image appears more circular due to the axial symmetry. And the reason to do this is that we are actually observing M87 star from Earth very close to its axis. And then by applying a blurring filter, uh, we obtain something which is very similar to the actual EHD observation.
So let, so again, this is from double negative. Okay. So now going back to the EHT image, you might have the following question. The emission that we see on the black hole image comes from which region exactly? So the source location of photons that make up the black hole image uh, is displayed here as bright regions in these two plots, each for a different emission model. So on the left, we have a low magnetic flux model known as SANE, uh, and, and on the right, we have the magnetic, uh, maximal magnetic flux model, or MAD, this one, uh, both for a curved black hole with a spin of 94%. And although both emission models are quite different, uh, both are actually consistent with the EHT observed image, which is uh, actually interesting. And the photon region, uh, which, which is responsible for the shadow, uh, is now highlighted in white. And you can see that there is still some emission contribution to the black hole image coming from outside of this region. So my key point, so the key point here is that the emission ring that we see on the black hole image does not have to coincide exactly with the black hole shadow edge. The observed, uh, the ob observed size of the emission ring was 42 micro arc seconds in the sky. However, from a large library of accretion, uh, disk, uh, accretion flows for, from the EHT collaboration, uh, it is estimated that the actual shadow size should be around 10% uh, smaller than this value. So a uh, quite conservative estimate for the shadow angular size of M87 star is then around 18.9 micro arc seconds, which is here denoted by the letter theta, Greek, uh, Greek letter theta, sorry. And this angle is related to other quantities by this formula here, uh, namely the observed distance L to the black hole, which is assumed to be large here, and the black hole mass scale M. And this expression includes also a model dependent uh, factor, dimensionless factor, that is represented here by this letter S. And for Kerr, this factor is typically around five. So a deviation from the Kerr model should impact on the value of this model dependent factor S. So currently there is a lack of tension between observations and the hypothesis that black holes are well described by the Kerr metric. And the Kerr paradigm is motivated by several uniqueness theorems, namely by Israel, Carter and Robinson which established that equilibrium black holes in the vacuum general relativity are described by the Kerr solution. This paradigm was summarized in the famous statement that black holes have no hair, where here hair embodies other parameters besides the black hole mass, spin, and also possibly electric charge. However, Kerr is still likely to be a good approximation within our current precision rather than the fundamental description of astrophysical black holes. So it is natural to ask the question, are astrophysical black holes really described by the Kerr metric? There are some ways to go beyond the Kerr paradigm by circumventing the uniqueness theorems. We can consider, for example, GDR with matter fields and leave vacuum. Uh, an example would be black holes with synchronized hair, for example. We can also consider compact objects that have no horizon, for example, gravistars, boson and broca stars, or we can leave GR altogether and consider extensions of GR. One of the simplest ways to circumvent uniqueness theorems is to simply consider general relativity with matter fields. And a possible scenario is to consider hypoth hypo hypothetical scalar fields with the mass mu which could be part of the dark matter content. And one can find full stationary black hole solutions uh, in this Einstein-Klein-Gordon theory with a complex massive scalar field minimally coupled to gravity. And these solutions are known as black holes with synchronized scalar hair. So a few comments uh, regarding these solutions. 
The metric ansatz displayed here is assumed to be stationary, axially symmetric, and asymptotically flat, with a reflection symmetry on the equatorial plane. The solutions are regular on and outside the horizon, and they satisfy all energy conditions. And all metric functions only depend on the radial and latitude coordinates. However, the stationary and nasimuthal killing vectors are not symmetries of the full solution. And due to the harmonic ansatz for the scalar field shown here, there is an explicit T phi dependence which does not appear at the level of the geometry. But from the field ansatz, there are two relevant parameters, the frequency omega and the harmonic index m, which do impact the geometry. Taking m equals 1, you can see here in this plot the solution space of these hairy black holes in a diagram of the total ADM mass uh, m versus the frequency omega. And the black holes with synchronized scalar hair exist in the light blue region, and they interpolate, inter interpolate I'm sorry, between the Kerr solution with the test scalar field, shown in dark blue, uh, extremal hairy black hole solutions, shown in green here, and rotating boson stars in the red spiral, which are just regular solutions that have no horizon. To discuss the images of these configurations, it is helpful to introduce a more academic setup for the moment. You can take a faraway colored sphere N, which you can take as the source of null geodesics. Light rays that reach the observer are perceived in a, in a local sky O, which is shown here, which is represented by a local sphere S2 around the observer. And in this context, an observation image is defined simply as a map from O to N. Then we can define the shadow of a black hole in a more precise way. It is simply the set of points in the local sky O that are mapped to N, that, sorry, that are not mapped to N, but rather to the black hole. For reference, uh, this is the Kerr observation image displayed here for a spin of 82%, uh, with the shadow represented in black. And you can notice how the Kerr shadow here, for example, without lensing, is simply connected with a smooth edge, and it is mostly circular. And now for a comparison, there are a few images here of hairy black holes and boson stars. As we move away from the Kerr line here, there are some significant deviations that can occur at the level of lensing and shadows. Focusing, for example, in this more extreme solution three, showing here in detail, you can find hairy black holes with uh, very non curl like features. For example, you can find black, for example, in this case, deviations from circularity, disconnected shadows with a non trivial topology, and even chaotic type lensing features in the image. And some of these uh, turbulent features in the image become quite apparent in a plot of the integrated time coordinates along each uh, geodesic. And you can notice how some regions require a lot more integration time by several orders of magnitude. Why is this? This can be better understood by analyzing the Hamiltonian describing free null geodesic flow. Assuming stationarity and killing symmetries, as well as circularity, we can separate the Hamiltonian into two terms, in, in the kinetic term K and an effective potential V, which cannot be positive. Um, and the null geodesics will depend critically on the impact parameter eta, defined here uh, as the ratio between the energy and angular momentum of the photon. Uh, from the, this Hamiltonian constraint, uh, the null geodesic cannot enter some forbidden regions of configuration space where the potential V is positive. This is represented here by the dark region in the right uh, 2 d plot that is spanned by theta and also a compactified radial quarter. And the null geodesic, the null trajectory that is represented here in blue, corresponds to point 0.1 on, here on the left image. 
And this trajectory cannot approach the black hole due to a potential barrier, which is provided uh, by this forbidden region in black. By changing the impactor parameter of the geodesic, so selecting now this point two, we can have an opening uh, on the forbidden region that allows light rays to fall into the black hole. And the point close to the shadow edge corresponds to a light ray bouncing back and forth forward close to this opening in the potential barrier. Now we can move, look at a rotating boson star and see what happens. Since this solution uh, does not have an horizon, it doesn't have a black hole shadow, it's only lensing. And for some boson star solutions, you can have disconnected uh, allowed regions, for example, this one, into the geodesic potential. And this can lead to bound orbits, which are connected to the existence of a stable light ring. For some values of the impact parameter, we can have a small opening, which is connected to an unstable light ring. So it was stable, and this one is, uh, sorry, the other one was stable, this one is unstable. And light rays can enter uh, a pocket such as this via this uh, small opening in the potential and can become trapped for a long time before being able to escape. And this is the reason for the long integration times that we saw before, and also for some of the chaotic like behavior in the image. And although this is an open question, it seems also plausible that this sort of behavior might trigger some type of nonlinear instability in the boson stars. Notice that this type of trapping can occur for solutions well before they can form an ergo region. And so these would not be connected in any way to an ergo region instability. Okay, so far these have been academic images of boson stars. Is it possible to, do, to distinguish an image of an accreting boson star from a Kerr black hole? That's an intriguing question. I would like to mention this recent paper by Olivares and collaborators, where they analyze syn uh, synthetic images of spherical boson stars with a realistic accretion flow. And curiously, despite having no shadow, strictly speaking, some boson star images can mimic a black hole shadow. However, the conclusion by the authors uh, was that given comparable conditions, the image size was smaller than Kerr. And so this difference would have been detectable by the Event Horizon Telescope. Okay, that was, uh, so for other recent work, you can also see these, these uh, other papers. So, so since boson stars do not, do not have an horizon, you might be intrigued on how it is possible for them to mimic a black hole shadow, even with a smaller size. As mentioned before, the black hole shadow is linked to the existence of light ring orbits. However, it is intriguing that these reported boson star mimickers do not have light ring orbits. And rather than having these orbits, an effective shadow appears to form when the object produces a stalled accretion of flow torus. And the length scale associated with this torus is connected with the existence of the maximum of the angular velocity omega um, outside the rotation axis for circular time-like time geodesics. And it is the existence of this maximum of omega that was observed in simulations made by Olivage and collaborators um, that was uh, apparently critical to determine the size of the torus in their image. Um, uh, so, so that determines the size of the torus in their image with the magneto rotational instability of or MRI uh, quenched inside it. However, it would be very interesting uh, if this torus scale would be comparable uh, to the Schwarzschild ISCO, so the innermost stable circular orbit. And indeed, uh, I'm quite happy to report that there exists stable spherical Proca stars, which is a cousin model of boson stars, that have a maximum uh, of omega at a radius comparable to a Schwarzschild uh, ice cone with the same mass. And so in principle, there are some Proca stars that might be able to mimic the shadow of a Schwarzschild black hole with the same size. So to test this idea, 
we have compared image of this special class of Broca stars and the Schwarzschild black hole uh, surrounded by a very simple thin disk profile. And for Schwarzschild, uh, we stopped the inner edge of the disk. So in this, this image, uh, we stopped the inner edge of the disk at the maximum of the angular velocity omega to sort of, uh, sorry, we stopped the inner edge of the disk for Schwarzschild at the ISCO. And for the Broca star, we stopped the disk at the maximum of the angular velocity omega so for, for the Broca star to sort of mimic the existence of an inner edge of a stalled accretion torus. And you can notice right away that there is a close resemblance between both images, although there are some higher order lensing details that do not exist for the Broca case. Uh, for example, this, this, uh, this effect here. Uh, however, these details are lost after you apply a Gaussian, a Gaussian blurring filter, which kind of mimics the current resolution of the EHD. And so to make the connection to the EHD observations, the observer was set at an angle of 17 degrees with respect to the axis. And this angle of 17 degrees is the expected observation angle of M87 star as seen uh, from the Earth. Let me say, however, that there is a caveat here. If you set an observation angle closer to the equatorial plane of the disk, you can easily see some differences between the images even when they are blurred. And this is due to the fact that this Broca star has a gravitational well that is actually not very deep and pr produces a fairly weak gravitational lensing. So this issue of actually testing this Broca star model with DHT observations of M87 star would require new uh, uh, GRMHD simulations, and perhaps this can be expected to be done in the near future. So we now move on to the issue of how much scalar hair would exist around an M87 uh, star black hole and still be compatible with the EHD uh, observation. To address this point, we must answer the question of whether it is possible to grow a hairy black hole starting from a curved black hole. And as you know, the energy of spinning black holes can be classically mined uh, by a bosonic field through subradiance. And it is through this process that a small seed of the field can grow and store a considerable fraction of the original black hole mass. Uh, for example, for a bosonic vector field, East and Pretorius have observed that around 9% of the energy can be extracted dynamically into the hair, forming a black hole with synchronized Broca hair. And a very similar value can be expected to the scalar case. But regardless, there is a thermodynamic upper limit of 29% to how much rotational energy can be extracted from a curved black hole. And it is also relevant to point out that black holes with synchronized hair are not completely stable. Uh, as was pointed out by uh, Ganshev and Santush, these hairy black holes are themselves prone to their own subradiant instabilities. So there are two relevant time scales here. There is the time scale for the formation of scalar hair. And the instability time scale of the scalar hair after, after it has formed. So there are these two different time scales. So the hair growth time scales rapidly when the mass of the boson lies outside a sweet resonance spot. For a near extremal curve, the maximum superradiant efficiency to extract energy is for MU around 0.4. Uh, for this mass, the hair can be expected to grow after 10 to the 4 years. If we go slightly outside this value, the hair growth time can easily become of the same order as the Hubble time, as illustrated in this uh, plot. So the key point here is that M87 star can grow scalar hair in an astrophysical time scale. Uh, and also that this hair is stable for all practical, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention. So regarding the instability 
of the hair after its formation. And as discussed uh, in this paper by, by Degollado and collaborators, the leading superadient instability time scale is larger than the Hubble time if, if m mu is smaller than 0.25. So the key point is that m87 star can grow scalar hair in an astrophysical time scale. And also, that is hair is stable for all, all practical purposes if the mass scale m mu is restricted between 0.05 and 0.25 more give or take so that is the bottom line here since m87 star has around 1 billion solar masses it is sensitive to boson mass scales around 10 to the uh, 10 to the minus 20 uh, electron volts and such scalar fields are therefore ultra light um, and outside the scope of the standard model, although they can find inspiration in the QCD axiom and also in the low energy limit of string theory. Going back to the solution space of black holes with a scalar hair, we can ask what is the region of interest uh, for these hairy black holes that can be grown from Kerr and become effectively stable. So this region exists close to the lower bottom of the spiral that you saw before. So here on the right, you have a zoom of, of that region of interest. And the blue line is just the Kerr existence line um, uh, with a test scalar field. And red line is, as before, the boson star line. Not all solutions can uh, be grown from Kerr. It is now highlighted the region that is within the thermodynamic limit of 29% for energy extraction from Kerr that was mentioned before. And uh, the next step is to analyze how does the shadow size change for these hairy black holes. So for this point, it is useful to introduce this quantity P here which is the fraction of mass outside the black hole. So in this way, when P is equal to zero, you have shadow, uh, the shadow is curved. And when P is equal to one, we have a boson star with no horizon and a vanishing shadow. And we can illustrate the variation of the shadow size uh, along the selected green solutions in the top right diagram here. So now you, we go back to that model dependent scale factor S of the shadow that was mentioned in the beginning of this seminar, and it is no longer necessarily phi. As we increase P, the, the, as we increase the value of P, the value of S decreases almost linearly, almost, not exactly. And we can take this analysis to make a very quick and naive estimate of how much hair M87 star could support. And given that the current shadow size measurement has an uncertainty of around 10%, then naively a black hole shadow that is 10% uh, smaller than Kerr could still be compatible with the HD observations. We can plot the shadow deviation from Kerr as a function of P and set a threshold of 10%, as shown here. And then we can conclude that M87 star would, in principle, be compatible with a hairy black hole that has around 11% of the total mass in the scalar field. But we can do a better analysis than this we can recall the relation between the shadow angle theta, the factor S, and the ratio of the black hole mass and distance L to us. And from measurements of star motions uh, uh, around M87 star, uh, which is this one, uh, the ratio of M over L was measured with some uncertainty. So we now can ask the question, Given this uncertainty in this M over L ratio, how much can we change the shadow factor S while the angle theta is still compatible with the HD observations within its uncertainty? And it turns out that within uh, one standard deviation, <clears throat> we can go to black holes with 12% of the mass outside the horizon. 
And this is very close to the quick estimates we did before. If we are willing to go to two standard deviations, we can even reach 24% of the mass in the scalar field. And this value is well within the thermodynamic limits of 29%. Uh, for completeness, let me also mention uh, that if we consider gas motion measurements for the ratio M over L, so gas motion instead of uh, star motion, um, uh, the same analysis would disfavor hairy black holes. However, it is worth pointing out that this data is also in tension, uh, there's some tension with the Kerr model by when you consider THT data. So the important point uh, here is that the current THT observations place a very weak constraint on the amount of scalar hair around M87 star, at least with the current precision. And to emphasize that this didn't have to be the case, uh, I'm going just to, to, to mention briefly uh, a different model beyond GR, extended scalar tensor gauss bonnet gravity which can give rise to scalarized black holes. So in this model, we have a dynamical coupling between the gauss bonnet term via function f of phi. And in order to have spontaneous colorization from a vacuum black hole into, in, in general relativity, to a scalarized black hole, this function must have, uh, this function f of phi must have both a zero derivative and a positive second derivative when uh, phi vanishes. And these conditions are satisfied for this particular choice of f of phi. And curiously, we can find black hole solutions for which non-GR effects are only significant for low spins. And in the static case in particular, shadows can be 40% smaller than Schwarzschild. This would mean that black holes with low spins would spontaneously scalarize and have very small shadows. And in principle, this would be, uh, uh, would be easily detectable by the HD uh, within current precision. Okay, so now I will move to the second part of this talk. Uh, uh, so, uh, which will discuss the main result of, of a fairly recent letter that was written in collaboration with Carol Zerdeiro, and that was published in, in PRL as an editor's suggestion. And uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of this of this part, we you that where uh, it will be discussed an argument which hopefully you might find both uh, simple and elegant. Hopefully. Uh, and although I cannot discuss the full details uh, now, uh, in, uh, how, how much time do I still have? You still have 15 minutes, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry? 15 minutes. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, I, I will try just to convey the main ideas and, and, uh, and concepts uh, of, this, of this result. So within the observation of gravitational waves by LIGO, and also the black hole shadow by the Event Horizon Telescope, we now have a window into the strong gravity regime close to black holes. And the observation signature uh, of, of both the gravitational wave ring down and the black hole shadows are strongly connected to a special class of null orbits called light rings. So light rings are spatially closed circular null geodesics. And in spherical symmetry, the clustering of light ring orbits forms the more familiar concept of a photonsphere. Light rings are known to exist in multiple space types, such for, for example, Schwarzschild and Kerr. And the analysis of specific black hole solutions in the literature has built an expectation in the community that all black holes must be surrounded by a light ring orbit. However, this expectation is not generally based on a solid foundation. So this leads to a quite natural question. Does an equilibrium black hole always possess a light ring orbit? Although it is plausible, it is also not trivial to give a generic answer. For example, how can we be certain that a light ring will exist around a black hole if we consider, let's say, a black hole that has no clearly defined equatorial plane? 
Nevertheless, it is important to state that a few results do exist in specific setups, assuming, for example, spherical symmetry. This is by no means a complete summary of the literature in this point. So in contrast, the result uh, I'm going to discuss uh, aims to be uh, more general. So in this talk, or, or at least in this second part, I'm going to assume a very generic equilibrium black hole space-time in four dimensions. The space-time is assumed to be stationary, axially symmetric, which is reasonable uh, in an equilibrium state. The horizon is uh, also assumed to be a non-extremal killing horizon with a spherical topology. We critically assume that space-time is asymptotically flat, and uh, we require continuous second, uh, continuous second order derivatives at least. And uh, finally, we assume that the space time satisfies causality, which is uh, fairly standard and also uh, circularity. <clears throat> Due to killing symmetries, we can restrict the analysis to spatial two dimensional space, which can be parameterized um, by an orthogonal spherical like coordinates are theta. Then we can make some gauge choices. We can make the coordinates are theta reduce to spherical coordinates at asymptotic infinity, and we can fix the horizon at a constant radial coordinate. Having discussed these underlying space time assumptions, we can now make a few comments about the null geodesic motion. Due to killing symmetries, the Hamiltonian can naturally be constructed, uh, sorry, can be used to construct a potential H. And importantly, uh, a vanishing gradient of H is both the necessary and sufficient condition uh, to determine the location of a light ring. But to simplify the discussion, uh, I will ignore the fact that there are usually two potentials for H, uh, each for a different rotation direction, since uh, I'm going only to consider the po only the positive one. But now let's make a brief detour in our discussion. Let's assume for the moment that the scalar potential H now defines the height of different points uh, on a hill. The equipotential lines near the top of the hill will have a profile similar to the ones on the left image. Imagine now that you take a walk around the hill along the closed red path in the image. The gradient of your function h will always be pointing inwards, and it is simple to conclude that a maximum exists inside. But let's try to find a rule that expresses this intuition in a more concrete way. You can see how the vector direction has changed with respect to the initial position A by looking at this angle indicator, which is this small circle next to the drawing. And importantly, as the person moves in the positive sense, um, a vec the vector also rotates here in the positive direction as displayed by the green angle. And as you move along, uh, and return to the starting position, the direction of the gradient vector is again the same, this one. However, the integrated angle does not vanish. By looking at the angle indicator, the vector has made one full turn in the positive direction. And this number will, does not depend on the exact path around the hill, as long as the hilltop is contained within the path. So we can now write our first rule that a maximum or a minimum for that fact, for that matter, uh, leads to one positive full rotation of the gradient vector. Okay, next we can take a more challenging setup. Two small hills connected by a saddle point. Uh, now when we... Uh, now, when we walk in the positive direction of a path around the saddle point, the gradient vector is rotated into the negative direction. This is displayed in the angle indicator now as a negative blue angle. So you rotate in the positive direction, but the vector rotates in the negative direction. And as you move, 
uh, along the path and you return to the initial position, the vector has made a complete rotation in the negative sense. And so this is, will be our second rule, which applies when the path contains a saddle point inside. Um, um, then what happens when we choose a, a path that includes both a maximum and a saddle point? As we start moving, the angle indicator starts showing a negative blue angle. However, at some point, the angle indicator inverts its direction at this point here and starts reducing. But and in the end, after we return to the initial point, the integrated angle has vanished. Has vanished. So the conclusion is that the number of turns follows an additive pr property. The final number of rotations will simply be the sum of contributions of the stationary points inside the path. So to, the, to apply this to our original problem, we first consider a two-dimensional plane that can be parameterized, say, by cylindrical-like uh, cylindrical coordinates, rho z, with the black hole on the coordinate center. We then start defining our path. We can first choose a section with a constant radial coordinate close to the horizon. Then we can continue this path by joining two sections with a constant theta close to the rotation, uh, rotating z axis. Then we can, choose, we can close the contour with a section that has a constant radial coordinate at a large radius. We can always modify the path like so and make it approach both the horizon, the axis, and spatial, and spatial infinity. And it is under this limit that virtually any point outside the horizon can be contained inside the path. Now for the physical conditions. The conditions of a finite Ricci scalar close to the horizon makes the gradient have a positive radial component. In a similar way, a finite Ricci scalar close to the rotation z-axis fixes the gradient orientation in the direction of the axis. And finally, at asymptotic infinity, the gradient must have a negative radial component. So now let's find, how, find out how the vector field rotates when we circulate the path in the positive sense. And for this, you might find the angle indicator in the bottom right to be helpful, helpful for this. Move, starting to move, uh, we can see right away that the vector uh, starts rotating in the negative sense, like so. And the integrated angle does not seem to have a monotonic behavior. It can invert uh, directions at some point, so, like so, as inverted slightly. However, when all is said and done, uh, when you return to the initial point, the gradient vector has described a complete negative rotation. So this means that there exists at least one saddle point of the potential inside the path. And so by construction, this means that there exists at least one light ring orbit outside the horizon. Um, for example, illustrated here. So this is the basic idea behind the argument and also the conclusion, at least of, of this part. And notice that we made no assumptions for the matter content or the underlying gravity model. And this approach can also show how asymptotic flatness is a key boundary condition. So I will end at least uh, with this part with the following question. With other asymptotic behaviors, uh, can we construct black holes that have no light ring orbits? And I would like to comment that, in principle, it is. But if, if, there is a recent paper where you show we, when you have a syntotic Melvin, uh, you can build, you can have a black hole that has no light ring orbit, uh, which uh, which is uh, interesting. Uh, okay, so I'm going to wrap up uh, with the main conclusions. So the recent image of M87 star has opened a window into the strong gravity region. And the current EHT precision places very weak constraints on the amount of scalar hair around M87 star. 
And with the next generation of EHD observations uh, expected within the following decades, we might get much better constraints. And regarding this second part, there's your theorem, uh, and also recently several generalizations that places the existence of light rings around black holes within a more solid and generic argument. And I will wrap up here. So thank you again. Thanks a lot, Pedro, for this remarkable talk. And uh, this is now open for any questions. So first of all, you can write questions to the chat and I will read it to you, or you can directly ask the question also. Just open your mic and ask question. So yeah. maybe, yeah, Rajesh, you have a question? Or? Yes. Yeah, please. So hi, Pedro, a nice hi. talk. Thank you. So now I have a question uh, yeah, for the, from the next part of your second part of your uh, talk that uh, you have assumed there the spherical topology of the event horizon, right? Yes. So that's, my question, that... Yeah. My question is if I, if I relax this condition that, for example, if I assume, for example, topological as some other topology, how this mm -hmm. group will change or is there any way? That's a very good question. So the, uh, although uh, the, this is not discussed in the, in the paper, uh, that, I, that I'm mentioning, um, it, it is one of the assumptions. I suspect uh, that this condition might be relaxed. So the, uh, the, the, the so uh, for example, assuming a non-extremal killing horizon, but uh, not necessarily topologically spherical. I suspect that this condition might be relaxed and still get the same result. But uh, uh, this is just a suspicion. It's worth what it's, what it's worth. I haven't actually made a, a rigorous uh, proof of this. But after thinking a little bit, I'm convinced that it should hold as well. It's a very interesting question. Thank you. Yeah, and also for extremal case, do you have any hint? Because you assume non-extremality. But extremal uh, black holes. Uh, well, if, uh, uh, well, you can show that um, even the extremal case, uh, you, you might show that you have at least one light ring, but if you want to show that you have one light ring for each rotation sense, it becomes tricky because for the, in the extremal case, uh, uh, you, can have, you can have one of the light rings approaching the horizon and it becomes tricky there. Uh, for example, in the Kerr case, um, there are some subtleties, I, I know there are some efforts in the literature to expand these results to extremality, but I would say it is subtle, very close to the horizon. It's 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 subtle, but it might be uh, uh, it might be possible to relax this condition as well. And also for asymptotically non-flat, for example, in the DC tail case, uh, the lambda doesn't really affect the location of the photon sphere, at least for spherically symmetric and static case. So whether it is asymptotically flat or not, uh, since the photon sphere location is not affected, uh, why do you think that it will affect uh, the uh, proof that you have? So uh, although you, you mentioned uh, uh, the sitter, right? Or... Yes. 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 And in, indeed, it doesn't seem to, to affect, to, to be affected. Uh, but as you can see uh, here, uh, the boundary, at least using the core of the argument, the boundary condition that can be uh, this, this contour, this part of the contour that can be pushed to infinity has some contribution, uh, plays uh, some, some role. And uh, although uh, I only said this briefly, if you, instead of the sitter, if you choose a, a space time, which is asymptotically Melvin, uh, this exists in solutions of a black holes with uh, with a magnetic field. There are some exact solutions. W at least one of them that I know uh, is asymptotically Melvin. It's not asymptotically flat. And for some uh, parameters in the solution space, you might not have light rings. You might have generalization of the spherical photon orbits, uh, but they are not uh, uh, light rings in the sense that I dis just described here. Uh, so, and the reason is that the contribution from the boundary condition uh, is different. It's not, uh, it's not the same as from the flat space time. So and, the key point is that the, the boundary conditions at this asymptotic infinity 
can have some role, although uh, in, in the case that you mentioned, in, this, in the Deceiter case, it, it is not very apparent. And uh, final question, uh, instead of a black hole, suppose I have a star, where would the derivation fail? Uh, if I have a star, say boson star, ah, yes. where would the derivation fail? Well, uh, you can actually use a very similar argument to this one to show that light rings must form in pairs for uh, an horizonless star. So the bound the, you don't get the same result because the boundary condition at the horizon is different. Once again, you have here, you can see my mouse, I hope. Yes, I can. Okay, so you have this, this dashed line of the contour, which will approach, uh, yeah, it will approach the horizon. And if you don't have an horizon, you don't have this boundary condition. You just have the boundary condition of the axis, which is different. Uh, in, in, the, in very naive terms, here the arrows but, are pointing outwards, but, but and here, the here they are pointing inwards. Yeah, but on the surface of the star, I can still assume Ricky scalar to be regular. I mean, just like here, you have assumed that on the horizon, Ricky scalar is uh, regular. Uh, yeah, so Yes, but even if you have a black hole which is tiny, you always have a light ring. That this is what this is showing, and it's kind of a, no. It's it's topologically non-equivalent to have a, a black hole which is shrinking and shrinking, and a, and a star that has no horizon. It's it's a, there is some discontinuity there. Um, uh, th that is the 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 the, the key thing. Uh, it, it's subtle, I agree, uh, but it's all it all comes down from the boundary conditions on the horizon. If you have a black hole, you have a boundary condition uh, on the horizon, which is if you assume a regular Ricci scalar. Yeah. And uh, if you don't have a black hole, you have only a star. Uh, you, if you approach the origin. Uh, of the of the coordinate system, you don't never have a black hole or a, a horizon, so it's regular, and that requirement of regularity of the Ricci scalar gives a different boundary condition. Okay. okay. It's, it, it, sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. No, it it, it is subtle. I I agree, but uh, um, it, it, but you can the argument does not fail in the sense it's simply. The, the, um, the boundary condition is different because you can use the same method to show that if for, a, for an horizonless spacetime, the, the total topological charge is zero instead of minus one. So in this case, what was shown was, let me just skim forward. Uh, the factor circulation might, makes a minus one for full rotation. If you don't have a, a, this boundary condition of the horizon, you would get a different result. You have zero, a zero full rotation. And so if you, uh, you can either have no light rings or you can have light rings that are formed in pairs. Typically, one being stable and the other one unstable, if you satisfy uh, the uh, null energy condition. So, Pedro, just to make a comment that uh, there is a work me and my student Rajesh did. So, instead of horizon, if you assume an atmosphere, mm -hmm. then the proof yes. will go through. You can show uh, there will be at least one, there will be a light ring solution outside, although the method is completely different. Mm, That's yes. Not a argument. Yes. Yes. No. There are different ways, of course, to to show uh, to to show these results. This is not the only one. Uh, there are others, uh, and even uh, taking into account the to show if there is a, a, a light ring inside or outside the uh, the ergo region, you can of course have better methods to show that. Yes. But it is true for general boundary condition for a general star. You cannot say anything. Except what your statement is, that uh, in pair. Uh, if you if the light rings form in pairs. Yeah, I mean beyond that, nothing else is known, right? Uh, I well, uh, I, I would have to check the literature to be uh, to be okay. sure. But uh, I know that if you want to be very general, I might not even know if there are, there is an ergo region or not. Okay. Uh, you have an ergo torus. Uh, wait, if you have an ergo torus. Uh, so, for a black hole, you can have uh, an, uh, an ergo region which is connected to the horizon, 
uh, or you can have a disconnected erg region uh, which has a form of a torus. Um, and that, uh, that's the case of the black hole. If you have only a star uh, with no horizon and you, and you want regularity at the axis, then you can only have an ergotorus. And if I recall correctly, I think you can show that if you have an ergotorus, you must have a stable light ring inside and uh, inside the ergotorus. And because of the argument I just explained, because they have to be, light rings have to be, to be created in pairs, then you need also to have an unstable light ring, which probably exists outside the ergotorus. Although um, not entirely sure how you can show, uh, perhaps using different methods, you can show that it must exist outside the ergotorus, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. I hope this addresses your, your question. Okay. So there is a question in the chat box by Partho, which says that, are your consideration valid if, as in the Kerr case, the potential has a dependence on the test particle energy? And when you say the shadow size is small for boson star, can you quantify what exactly the small means? Can you yeah. quantify the small better? Uh, sorry, I am not sure if I understood the first question very, very well. Can you please repeat that? Uh, so I think it says that the potential has a dependence on the test particle energy, then is the, all the arguments are valid. Uh, yes, uh, they are. So because the, let me just go back. I, I, because I'm, I, I'm, uh, so in this part, uh, the, this, this effective potential H does not depend on the energy of the particle. Uh, so th th you, you could define, uh, how can I explain this? You can have this Hamiltonian H, you can separate into two terms, a kinetic term and a potential term. That potential, uh, let's call it V, does depend on the energy of the particle. But from that potential, you can factorize the energy and angular momentum of the particle to define this potential H, uh, which does not depend on the energy of the particle, only depends on the metric of the space-time. Uh, and so it, it does not. And the second uh, part of the question says that, uh, can you quantify, uh, the shadow of the boson star is small. Can you quantify the small better? Mm. No, the shadow of, of the boson star is zero. It does not exist. <laughs> uh, so you can have a black hole with, uh, with essentially with a lot of a scalar field around it and a tiny black hole in the center, but that is still a black hole, a hairy black hole space time. If you have a boson star, it is, it's, it is a star. It does not have an horizon. So the shadow is uh, formally zero. Um, Although you can have uh, a, an effective shadow, not sure if that was the question, perhaps. Uh, so let me distinguish between these two scenarios. We have an exact sh shadow of a black hole, for example, for a Kerr. The uh, boson star does not have a shadow uh, in the sense I just described because there is no black hole uh, nor uh, an event horizon, but it can have an effective shadow in the sense that there is a region in the image which is darker. I would call it effective because it can mimic a shadow. But if you have, for example, uh, emission coming from well within the interior of the star, you wouldn't see this. So this is a feature that depends, for example, on the dynamics of the accretion flow. So it uh, it's, doesn't have such a deep meaning as compared with the black hole shadow. So any I hope other? this addresses the question. Yeah. Thanks for the, any other question, please feel free to ask. Hi, can I ask one more question? Yeah, please sure, go. please. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in, in the model that you have assumed that it is like uh, a GR plus some extra scalar field. Now, uh, yeah. I mentioned two different models, the one in general relativity and other uh, outside. Which one do you mention? Uh, are you referring? I, I think the second one, the general relativity plus some scalar field, a minimally coupled case scalar field. Ah, so the, okay. So the one uh, within general relativity, minimally coupled. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, just... In this case, my question is that, uh, is there any way to uh, uh, distinguish between the various topologies from the shadow? Because this model can give you different topology, right? Uh, which is different from H2, I think. Uh, 
uh, well, no, actually. So there is a difference okay. between the topology of the horizon and the topology of the shadow. My, it, it might. <laughs> uh, so in, in this black hole, the shadow has a non-trivial topology, but the, the topology of the horizon is still S2. All these solutions that uh, that exist in this configure in this solution space have a topology of S2. It might be possible to perhaps to generalize this, uh, but probably you had to violate energy conditions. Uh, so for solutions, uh, all these solutions I, I described have uh, S2 topology. They are topologically spherical, but the shadow, so the image that you see of the black hole does not have to be a, a circle. So it ha can have a non-trivial topology. You can have disconnected parts. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. If there is no more questions, is there a question, anybody? Wait. So there is one question in the chat box by Shamik. It says that we know that accretion of matter around black holes can enter up to the event horizon, but we are not showing photon coming out inside the unstable photon orbit. Is this because high lensing effect? Uh... Sorry, sometimes I have uh, issues with the connection. Uh, perhaps I uh, uh, chat. Let's see if I can read it. Uh, even you know, accretion, accretion or, or well, uh, high lensing. Uh, I think you. I think I understand the question. Can I, if you please elaborate in this part? So. Um, uh, if I remember, so this is uh, th this depends a little bit on the accretion flow, uh, on the dynamics of the accretion flow. Um, there are so uh, if you have a scattering process, uh, if you, like this, I have to go back and leave you a few slides. Here, so if you have a scattering process of light rays, if if a given light ray crosses a photon sphere or crosses the photon region, or the photon of the photon sphere with the impact parameter of that light ray, uh, it it falls and it cannot uh, it cannot go back. So if you don't have emission of radiation within uh, the the photon sphere, that region indeed determines the edge of the shadow completely, you see black inside. Um, however, if you have matter falling into the black hole, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated because I, if I understand your question, indeed there are some matter that just before entering the horizon can radiate back. And that, uh, since it's outside the horizon, that radiation can actually escape and can be seen at infinity, but, in, but generally, it suffers from a high redshift. Uh, I don't. I cannot. I don't know uh, how much you you see in the, in this image that it is from that uh, matter that is falling. I wouldn't say that uh, that a substantial part is because, as you can see here, the bright regions uh, in these in these uh, in these plots. Uh, determine the, the source location of photons that make up this black hole image. And it's the, 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 although you can ha may, may have some small contribution very, very close to the black hole, um, it might, it, it, the, 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 most of it does not. Um, uh, but this could, this could be an effect, yes, you can, and especially that might be become relevant as you improve the quality of the images and the, and the resolution of the images and uh, that you have some some emission of of radiation of matter falling uh, within the photon region that is radiating back um, uh, although that radiation will uh, is typically highly redshifted both because of the gravitational well and also because of the Doppler redshift um, um, but it might play a small role, typically. Uh, and that has to be taken into consideration also for, to compute the shadow uh, size. But at the moment, this is, I, uh, there are some other more relevant effects at, at this stage, uh, I would say, namely from the fact that uh, 
I think the main limiting factor is the resolution of the image, which is, of course, a great feat of engineering to have obtained the necessary resolution to observe the image of M87 star, but still uh, the resolution of the image is, is not that great to, to, to extract, to constrain uh, the currentness of the black hole, I would say. As I mentioned, the image that we have in principle, it's still compatible with the hairy black hole, so. Okay, with this, we like to conclude the session. We thank Pedro from, uh, for giving the talk. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you.